first demo. It's been so long since I've seen the outside. We've been quarantined in our home for two fortnights and the enemy is drawing near. But we didn't know that our adversaries would be those sworn to defend us. The men are weary from rest and we long for the days our sergeant beckoned us to march. I've almost gone through all the meat in the freezer and by now I've watched everything on Pornhub. And I mean everything. From BBC to BBW to CIM, I now know more about the proclivities of the sexual deviant than anyone should ever know. And as the cold winter gave way to sunshine and 90 degrees, we felt the end was coming. But then our tyrants closed the beach. They've taken that away from us now. So we're all in our one bedroom apartments in Koreatown with limited air conditioning and unlimited repositioning of our sweaty balls on the couch. There's no escape from the doldrums of daily duties and we just d- d- disintegrate into debauchery like dutiful debutantes on Derby Day. Yeah, that's a lot of D's, but I know the D you're thinking of. And I swear, my sweet love, as soon as I can break out of this prison, I'll bring it to you. Please check on Mama for me and know that this whole great world, there's no rather place I'd rather be than held in your loving arms. Sincerely, The Toolbox. I can't remember anything. Can't tell if this is true or dream. Deep down inside, I feel to scream. This terrible silence stops me. Now that the war is through with me, I'm waking up, I cannot see that there is not much left of me. Nothing is real but pain now. Hold my breath as I wish for death. Please God wake me. From Adam's house and Gina's house and Brian's house, this is the Adam Carolla Show. Adam's guest today, the host of This is a Collect Call from Sing Sing, prison journalist John J. Lennon. With Gina Grad on news, Paul Brian on sound effects, and we'll play the Rotten Tomatoes game. And now, telling Gavin Newsom for closing the beaches to, ironically, go pound sand. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get on mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for sharing during this quarantine news fest we're all going through right now. Good day, Gina Grad. Good day to you. And Bald Brian. This recorded call is from an inmate at a California correctional facility. Yeah, that guy is uh, calling from uh, Sing Sing. I have an interesting uh, interview with him. So, uh, it's insightful. It's, it's interesting nice. to talk to people that are locked up. It's also interesting to talk to people who are locked up when they're like locked up when they're like 22 and now they're 44. Yeah. It's like right. their entire they're life. Right. Yeah. Like it's, and it's just, oh God. Anyway, God, if there, I, there's so many people that just wish they could take a mulligan, you know, <laughs> just a one thing, you know, that one thing you, you did when you were 22 or 23 that completely destroyed your whole life. The thing that's interesting about him is they offered him a plea deal of like 15 years and he went, nah, nah, screw that. Now he's been in, he's been in for like 19 or 22. Wow. Now, so we okay. passed on that. All right. Uh, yeah, before Gene, we go too much farther, let's acknowledge that was a pretty fantastic toolbox by oh, Dawson, including sorry. the banjo version of one by Metallica. Where the fuck did you find that? Thank you. It's a band called the Iron Horse, and they, they have a bluegrass album of all Metallica covers. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Yes, that was fantastic. incredible. We, we, we went on a little longer than we we're planning on, but I don't think we could get the message maybe to uh, Dawson to we wrap it down. It. Or he was waiting. I don't know. It could have been artistic choice. Yeah, he went rogue. He went cowboy. <laughs> Maybe I went rogue. Um, all right. So, yeah, fantastic job. Very, very, uh, I, I, you know, the, this quarantine is, is going to bring out some, some stuff and some people that mm-hmm. is going to uh, prove to be interesting. You know, people are going to have thoughts they didn't have. They're going to pick songs they didn't pick. They're going to yep. go different directions. They're, it's just, it's just a, it's an, in, I, I thought of a song that I hadn't thought, I don't know if you guys find yourself thinking of things you haven't thought about in a long time. Yes. I 
thought of a song that I wrote when I was in high school. I used to just write parody songs. And I had a couple of Weird friends Ace. Who, who wrote, yeah, wrote parody songs. Weird Ace, yes. And I couldn't play an instrument or do anything. I just had a sense of humor. And I write parody songs, but the theme, now here's where we take a term for the, a turn I should say for the homoerotic. Okay. The theme okay. is I had a friend with a huge hog. He had a big <laughs> dick. <laughs> and so the theme to my parody songs were my friend who, oh, let's just call him Ted. Ted had a big dick. And so when I was 17, I would write parody songs about my friend's big dick. Flattering. <laughs> a, lo a real love letter. Yeah, please, by all means. <laughs> we don't have to call him Ted. We should call him whatever the hell his name is. We did a whole lot of things that a lot. Yeah, why are you protecting this guy's anonymity? This guy's I a think, hero. I think he'd appreciate it. <laughs> he, uh, we did a lot of stuff that people thought were pretty gay. And uh, actually, it was very gay. But we weren't gay, which is weird. Um, we just did a bunch of super gay stuff. So, so give us a song title. Well, <laughs> I'm laughing because I'd never thought about this in, you know, 40 years, 35 years or whatever. But the song title is Both Sides Now by Judy Collins. I love that song. <laughs> oh, are you going to besmirch Both Sides Now? <laughs> I'm going to do something to it. Oh, don't desecrate. I love this song. Uh, so I'll let you, we'll play a little bit of the song. It's a, it's a popular song. A lot of people don't know it by title, but when they hear it, it's a beautiful song. Goes and flows of angel hair and ice cream castles in the air. And labias it would tear. that <laughs> way. Oh yeah. It's <laughs> got the sun. They rain and the creed on everyone. So many things I would have done. But clouds got in my way. I've looked at Ted, he's tall and thin. Direct descendant of Jism Jim. It's eight to ten, if I recall. I really I can do the whole song. Let me see for the top. <laughs> 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 I read a song about my friend's big dick. <laughs> all right, hold on, hold on. All right, all right, stop, stop song. Sorry. Reset. All right, all right. You, you, I'll just sing it a cappella. Okay. Rose and flows of pubic hair and multicolored underwear and labias it would tear. I've looked at Ted that way, but now it only blocks the sun. It pees and secretes on everyone. So many paths I could have run, but Ted's junk got in my way. I've looked at Ted, he's tall and thin, a direct descendant of Jism Jim. It's eight to ten, if I recall. I really don't know how at all. And I, I, that's the only part of the song. I wrote the whole fucking song about a guy. It's a song by a gay guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, many questions. One, yeah. how is this uh, knowledge acquired about his giant hog? Who would you sing the song to? Oh, <laughs> would he request it at parties? I would. Well, this, this other thing, we all knew what everyone's dick looked like. We've done so much skinny dipping and fighting uh, naked on uh, my friend Tom's diving board at night, and so much uh, pe peeing on each other that everyone was. Very aware of little. everyone else's hog, one hundred percent every time. So I knew everyone's dick. If I, if you took my ten buddies from high school and they just put their dick through a hole in a piece of plywood, I could put a post-it note just above it as to whose honk, whose crank was attached, uh, was on the other, who was on the other end of that crank. So um, I wrote this song. I think I 
I would sing it to him. I would sing it to other guys in my group. I'm not sure why Judy Collins was the theme for this guy's big dick song. And, and of course, we, I always had the Spider-Man theme, hmm. which was um, because the guy's nickname was Torpedo Man. That was his, that was his nickname. Yeah. Right. Earned. Beat City so Missile. I had Torpedo Man, Torpedo Man, does whatever Torpedo can. Uh, like something like shoot some jizz any length, man. That stuff's Torpedo. Torpedo strength. Look out. Here goes Torpedo Man. Is he tough? Listen, Muff. He's got radioactive stuff. Can he swing from your head? Take a look on the bed. Hey there. There goes uh, Torpedo Man. In this. Uh, there's something about a, uh, on the scene of a rape or something. Listen, he flies Muff. by this torpedo cape or whatever. But I, I was a horrible student. I, I wasn't doing homework or writing book reports. I was writing songs about my friend's big dick. <laughs> a weird thing to do in high school, right? Adam, did you do your homework? Well, no, but <laughs> I did compose if I can address song. the class. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about how insane that was and how whatever it is, I guess whether you, you know, have a steady girlfriend and you're in ROTC or you write songs about your buddy's dick or you're a serial killer, I guess it feels kind of normal when you're doing it. Like sure, I, didn't, sure. I didn't know how abnormal this was. I don't know how many other guys wrote songs about their friends' big dicks in high school. <laughs> you imagine other groups of friends. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that just came back to me. I don't, I don't know why. But all, all things that are sort of like, um, see if I, can, if I can give the analogy, but it's like all good monster movies or many good monster movies start with an underwater earthquake that unleashes this sure. thing that's been dormant sure. for all these right. years. This is sort of that underwater earthquake that unleashes a bunch of shit that was buried beneath the ocean floor, like yeah. never to be seen again. It's all floating to the yep. top now. It was always wow. there. It just took the right event to, uh, uh, to trigger it. Well, think you know, you kind of think about your thoughts. It's like your schedule. What's next? Who's on the phone? What's going on? Like you're not squeezing in thoughts about your friend's big hog in between. I got to go to the dentist and I got to, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But uh, now I have time. Oh, I can't wait to see what else is unearthed in that uh, Rolodex of yours. Yeah. Well, I know the ones I know is I know there's the uh, American pie version of this guy. Big dick. Sure. But that's a little long. That's probably nine minutes. <laughs> that's the same as. I had a lot of range. I did Judy Collins, the theme to Spider Man, and uh, American Pie in terms Played of uh, the guy's big dick. Yeah. Uh, Gina, you celebrated a birthday over the weekend. I did, and I didn't really mean to. I uh, thank you. I uh, I was gonna chill. I worked a lot on Friday, and you know, and and it was lovely. And I got home, and Andy was in a suit with a tie and dress shoes, and made this lovely dinner. And nice. it was just, it was very nice. Um, but I told everyone my plan for Saturday was to stay in bed and watch movies and rest. And that's all I wanted to do. So Andy gets up kind of mid morning, early ish, and he's like, "Let's get up." We're we're gonna take a walk. I was like, okay. And then I start struggling with myself. Oh my God, he's worried about me. He thinks I'm depressed. He thinks I'm fat. He thinks I'm this, he thinks I'm that. He thinks we need to start walking. So I just, I go, okay, all right, fine. I don't have any makeup on. My, I, I'm basically wearing a trash bag. I, I look horrible. And he's now he's going, hold on, we can't go yet. So I'm getting pissed and I don't know what's going on. Well, turns out a few of my very dear friends had a little surprise in store for me. Um, I don't know if you've seen many videos about people doing these drive-by birthday parades. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I got one and oh. I didn't know it, um, so but nice. they, they filmed it. And I'll show you the beginning. Before this, that's them getting ready and it's very cute. But this is me walking out of the house. And if I look freaked out, it's because I see a guy with a telephoto lens hiding behind our trash can. And you I'm asking used to the paparazzi. <laughs> I said, Andy, get the key, get the key, lock the door. And I don't know what's going on. Of course, I'm in my I Agree With Me shirt. I'm seeing some balloon. Oh, oh you poor fucking neighbors. That's all I can think about right now. <laughs> your poor neighbors. 
Yeah, oh, they loved it. That people were sure. shouting. They it was very it. sweet. So <laughs> I'm crying, laughing. And all these cars are going by with signs and balloons. And of course, because it's me, I'm just, I'm beside myself. I'm just, that, there's Randy. I'm laughing so hard. And then I just immediately start crying because I just was so, I just thought this was so sweet. That's nice. <laughs> what time was this? Oh, you know, about noon. Uh, not bad. It was really funny. And it, she did this really great video and hired two, two videographers. And uh, then I went back to bed and we ordered Don Cuco and watched a bunch of movies. <laughs> I had a great day. That was very sweet. <laughs> Is Don Cuco still in where? North Hollywood? No, Burbank. It's by... Oh, it's Burbank. It's, it's on kind Olive. Of, yeah. Yeah. It's like kind of on the border. Is yeah. Don Cuco good yeah well it's one of andy's old favorites when he used to work at the iheart building so i just started going there because of him and it's it's good it's just it's kind of a fun place because it's very like warm and cozy inside but you of course can't eat there you now. come to me on my daughter's wedding day exactly <laughs> but it, so we ordered that we watched i told brian watch killing them softly uh -huh. then i made andy watch music man and uh and uh just had a, a very lovely relaxing rest of the day but the parade was very sweet <laughs> I forgot to tell Chris in our musical theme, I keep thinking about uh, Gina doing her Cher impersonation, and I keep thinking about that uh, Cher song, Dark Lady, which uh, we'll oh, have to get into. because that Oh, you do. Do I? Okay. You do, oh, also, yes. I forgot to tell you, I had my traditional birthday pie, because I mm. too don't, I, I'm not a birthday cake person. And mm -hmm. ever since I was little, I would always request a strawberry pie for whatever reason. So yeah. Andy got me That's a big good. strawberry pie. It was nice. great. Yeah, nice. in season, the best. Yeah. Um, Dark all right. Uh, I, I had this funny conversation with uh, Mike August, who was uh, complaining the other day because he's like, he has some rental property and he's like, AOC's telling everyone not to pay the rent. Like we're going on a rent strike. Nobody pay the rent. And Mike was pissed. <laughs> and I said, uh, you know, Mike, and, and I've, oh, I've always kind of, I've always said this and I've, I've always kind of meant it. I always said sort of, you know, control the language and then control the narrative and control the outcome. And so it's so like really work. I've always talked to you guys about how we're always working on this language, you right. know, it's like, not a rape victim, rape survivor. And it's just like a constant tweaking of the language. But some of the language you tweak to kind of get your way. Like if you call somebody in this country an illegal alien, then you have every right in the world to remove them, mm -hmm. right? But if you call them an undocumented worker, it's sure. a little less you got to get yes. rid of them. And then if you just call them immigrants. It's like, what do you mean? We built this country on immigrants. We You're can't. an immigrant. I'm an immigrant. Right. So you kind of change the title and, and it'll help with what you'd like to get done. I sure. mean, yeah. Undocumented on worker seems like a clerical error. Yes. Or, yeah, just, but you, you don't it, have a document. It's now, it's now just immigrant. We're all just immigrants, right. you know? So fine. I said, Mike, you know, the problem, you're a landlord. Yeah. You're the lord of the land. That's well, a bad connotation. You. Why you shouldn't AOC stiff you for a year? You're the lord of the <laughs> land. You know what I mean? Like, Who made you the lord? <laughs> yes, you land lord you. Like, yeah. no, you're, you're lording it over them. Right. You, yes, you can't take a, 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 an immigrant or, or an undocumented or whatever and throw them out of here, but fuck those landlords. <laughs> They're the lords of the land. Yep. You're not the lord you know, of me. Was, yeah, it's like, Mike, here's the deal. You got to come up with a different title. Like, yes, we need to change the landlord title because AOC, like I said, it's, it's like we we're talking about with uh, nice. Ice is the worst thing ever. Ice is what a mafia guy does to another <laughs> guy who's talking too much. Like ice pick in the neck, like ice that guy, yeah. you know, but yeah. nice national boom. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say off the top of my head, everything I can think of with the suffix Lord has a very negative connotation. You mentioned the mafia, warlord, crime Lord, right, drug right. Lord, like I'm sure there, might, there might be some good ones out there. A gay Lord might be some good ones out there, but I don't, I don't <laughs> know of them. Yeah. If we just switch it to housing provider, then we don't have a problem. Yeah. Like shelter provider. Right. Shelter lordess. Yeah. Lord is really taking shelter on a angel. negative connotation. 
Right. So Lord is bad and land is bad. And <clears throat> if they ever put it to a popular vote who thinks the landlord should be stiff, you're going to get stiff. But <laughs> shelter providers, yeah. I don't know if you'd want to stiff that person. So it's, it's high time that the uh, boring old white folks start working on their names as well. Yep. And uh, landlords got to go. That's very astute. Every, if you ever become an owner, if you ever own an apartment building or own a warehouse and rent it out to somebody or something, you'll realize that every law is against you. There's nothing you yep. can do. Like, it's like this guy, he, he was in my warehouse. He owed me 50 grand. He didn't want to pay. Eventually he left. It's like, what are we going to do? Nothing. There's nothing you can do. You're the landlord. California law, especially heavily favors the renter. Right. So, um, land and Lord is something we're going to have to get rid of the other, um, Two uh, things. Uh, oh, uh, Doss and I finished our audio book, so that is now tub. done. Nice. That's great. Yeah, that's good. It's good to it's good to get some you, some stuff done. You ate the Buick. Yeah, it just chip <laughs> just chip chip away. And I'm telling you, everybody, um, I literally like Dawson came in and handed me eh, like a one inch thick bundle of paper, and I was measuring my little thickness of my bundles like okay in two hours i can do a quarter inch of papers and i put the stack like off to the side and i was like mm -hmm. okay we're going to do another little stack and then in four more sessions we'll have this quarter inch will be a one inch and i you break it all down you can do you can do just about anything sorry phil walked in here she never Aww. does and he's like it, it's weird like he's trying to get comfortable but it's not comfortable he's trying to get i think he's trying to pass out or or die because he like lays down on the carpet and he goes man this isn't comfortable enough and then he gets up on top of the chairs and he lays <laughs> down again come here phil and then he goes you let him on the this, chairs those fancy chairs this, so this place a goddamn free-for-all now he hops up now he hops Tilt up your, on the uh, other chair computer. we gotta see this okay let me uh oh, this is gonna be a bad my, idea he's gonna break everything this is yeah. the last podcast everyone <laughs> Let's see. Let's see if I can. Uh, I see some. Aww. There he is. Oh, oh baby boy. <laughs> hey, Phil. <laughs> Phil. No. All right. Aggressively uh, ignoring you. He's down for the count. That's crazy. Um, anyway, hey, it's, it, dogs are weird in that he never comes down here and hangs out when I'm doing this. Now he's he's come down and hung out, but he's turned his back to me and he's not even looking at me. But there's something something that's different about today. All right, uh, let's see. Um, what did I want to say? Oh, uh, also, so on a bad note, uh, that th this weekend, this last weekend, would have been the professional Trans Am race from uh, Laguna Seca. So there is, uh, there's that. Um, I want to play you guys this trailer for uh, Tyler Perry, uh, The Oval. <laughs> So you guys saw about 15 seconds of people don't know what Tyler Perry does. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, he's, I, I do. I think Whitey just kind of goes, oh, that guy is a rich entrepreneur. He writes uh, shows like, ah, I'm not really into it, but I, you know, you know Godspeed. But I, I told you, I watched his diary of a mad black woman i think like 15 years ago when like tyler perry was exploding onto the scene and onto oprah and all this stuff and i watched it and i was like there is something wrong with this guy like this stuff is sub bad this stuff is sort of you know when you're you know when you're like in a hotel room and you're just rolling through TV stations and you run into some weird station and you look at it and you look at it and then they start speaking Spanish or German or something and you go, oh, okay, all right, that's not, that's not our show. That's, right. that, that's why it seems weird because right. it's from a different land. Tyler Perry stuff is all that way. Like you cannot believe the stuff he's creating in the modern era. It, also bad when you can't get a grip right away whether something's supposed to be comedy or not or parody or not you know what i mean you're like is this is you flip on something is this a joke or am i not getting the joke or is this 100 percent serious he is a hundred percent serious which was what makes it comical to me yeah. so uh i just was skimming through the stations uh, the other day and i came across 
Tyler Perry's latest uh, show on. I don't even know. Is it on BET? That's what it says here. But, but either way, uh, I will, uh, I'll just play you the, the trailer. The wait is over. Don't you dare pretend to be worthy. I see the porn reflecting in your glasses. The most talked about show on cable has left audiences shocked and begging for more. You are a freak. On May 6th. We will lose everything. The Oval returns. She tried to kill the president. So buckle up. What's it like being married to a gay man? And brace for impact. <laughs> Tyler Perry's The Oval returns all new and live Wednesday, May 6th at 9. The- all right. Well, there you go. I was. I, that's how Tyler Perry writes. There are elements of that. Granted, that's just a promo. There are elements of that that seemed like over, like broad parody comedy, like Naked Gun style stuff. That's why I'm smitten by it. <laughs> like, if it if it was intentional, I wouldn't be nearly. I wouldn't be interested at all. It's all unintentional because I've watched oh. many of his movies, and that's how he writes. And people are down. Like people, he Absol- has. There's an audience for it. Absolutely. Now it it gets a. I mean, I saw on like IMDb, it was like 3.8 or something. Like it's really hard to get below a five on uh, IMDb. So it's not, you know, critically acclaimed, but that is him earnestly writing. And it just got renewed for another season? Hell just about to a million, the yes. A million viewers an episode, more or less. Do you remember when he took that show on the road? It was like a, like a gospel church, like stage show, Mm -hmm. the Medea, you know, Mm -hmm. Easter or whatever. So there isn't, there is an audience for this. Well, that's how, yeah, that's how he got started. He got started doing uh, like the Chitlin circuit, Medea, like live, I think, you know. Kind of like in a mama's family way. Yeah. I, I, listen, I never begrudge anyone's motor. Like I love a motor. love that guy. You should love and Tyler Perry. Yeah, I should. Yeah. And, and, and look, in a, in a weird way, Tyler Perry, um, DJ Khaled, the Kardashians, like only in America, baby. Yeah. Like yep. only yeah, in America could it's American people, dream. F- people from wherever background who possess little to no talent actually come in and just become billionaires. Like yep. that, yeah. that, that is here. Force of personality. We the best. Uh, that is absolutely right. All right. Uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Uh, David Katz on here, who I saw on Bill Maher a couple of weeks ago. He's going to come in uh, uh, tomorrow and uh, talk about some of his notions <clears throat> of the coronavirus. And uh, seemed like a pretty uh, reasonable guy. So we'll get into that in a second. And, Let, and just, yes. just because there's so many and so many experts, especially now, what kind of, is he, what kind of a doctor is he? I think he's, he's in an emergency doctor. room. Oh, he's, he's a, a medical a, doctor. Oh, sorry. Yeah, he's a, okay. he's a, he's a, I think he works in Manhattan. He works in the ER. And gotcha. Says exactly. here, says public health specialist, taught medicine at Yale. Got it. There you know, they're go. professor, doctor, whatever. Yeah. And of course, <clears throat> he's tr- trying to make the kind of get back to it uh, argument, which, uh, which I am, which is all, all I'm saying is, uh, California is not Manhattan. Uh, let's uh, let's start to let's start to figure this one out, man. Well, I don't know if you guys saw this. I should have sent it to Chris because I couldn't believe it. Did you see the the tweet of the helicopter? Uh, uh, apparently, it was a helicopter over in Huntington Beach here in Southern California with a megaphone saying, "Like, please disperse. Thank you for cooperating in these uncertain times." <clears throat> I mean, it was so sci-fi. Oh, you know, it's more sci-fi. The drones. The police oh, yeah. disperse mm-hmm. drones, which is, you know, normally there's some Orwellian sci-fi dystopian future where you go, oh, that's close to what they were talking about. This is dead nuts on. Oh, like the yeah. drone that's just overhead telling you to, yeah. telling you to disperse. Yeah. It's a step, we're a step away from Minority Report. Yep. But the spiders, remember, the spiders were going and truck everyone oh yeah i love that love that i uh i'm gonna hit uh jb weld here and then we'll uh do some um uh what are we gonna do uh, rotten tomatoes, tomatoes game yeah diy projects man get involved with one of those uh or two of them and get your head on straight use some jb weld man they're a fine sponsor uh i was just using some of their glue their super glue or instant glue or one part stuff to fix a serving tray by the way yesterday 
DIYers trust JB Weld for over 50 years, proudly made in the US of A. Keep JB Weld in your toolbox, kitchen drawer, craft room, metal, wood, plastic, and more. Don't glue it, man. JB Weld it. So seriously, if you guys are going to be around the house, you're going to do some projects, or you're going to fix some stuff up. Like I said, I just fixed this uh, serving tray, but um, go and get yourself some JB Weld. Have it on hand available at jbweld.com, Home Depot, Lowe's, AutoZone, Advanced Auto Parts, O'Reilly, Walmart, Amazon, Michaels, and more. JB Weld it, man. All right, let's take a uh, quick break, and we'll come back, play the Rotten Tomatoes game right after this. Oh, salutes the winners of the COVID-19 pandemic. Peloton, your commercials went from merely annoying to newsworthy, and you were taking a ration of crap on the internet for your ad with the Stockholm Syndrome wife. But then an actual problem came along, and the fake outrage patrol moved on. So now, while we're all stuck at home binging TV and snacks, gaining double-digit pounds, which will henceforth be called quarantines, as in, I gained quarantine pounds, you're riding the distraction like one of your stupid bikes. Oh, and people are buying them. Peloton, while we're all losers, you are the winner of COVID-19. So true. I, um, you know, there's a nice process that uh, everyone can get involved with, which is, um, and you know, it's weird. See, I, I have a um, advantage because I'm finishing or just finished my fifth book. There's no goddamn way I'd ever write a book unless someone came to me and paid me to write a book. So when I say to you, write your own book, it's hard because no one's paying you who's listening to write a book. But it, that beginning, middle, end process, like, I do love it. Like I was, I was walking Phil uh, a couple of days ago and I was talking to Byron Allen's people. And I was like, you want to do this comedy for, for food, star studded, whatever. And me event. And they're like, yeah, we need something that's like two, three minutes or something or two to five minutes and self-contained. And, but you know, we don't have film crews and we don't edit, you know, editing's going to be tough. Like the whole process is going to be tough. And, so I was just sort of like walking and talking and I, and they were pitching me some ideas and I was like, okay, all right. And then I kind of had, then I went to Mike Lynch and I was like, Mike, you have any ideas? Here's kind of the parameters. And then he had an idea and then we started kind of fleshing it out, you know, and writing beats down. And uh, on Saturday I went and shot it and we'll edit it uh, on Monday today as you hear this and turn it in. But just that process of like, huh, there's this thing and how long, and then you just start. It always feels, you always feel super vulnerable at the mm -hmm. beginning because at the very beginning, it's like, I don't know what I want to do. I don't have any yeah, ideas. Right. And then you're in a dark room with no light. Then what happens is, you know, I wake up Saturday morning and I say, Mike, you know, send over a bunch of whatever. And he does. And then I look at it Saturday morning and I'm like, oh, none of this is that good. Like, none of this is very funny to me. But then I call Mike and we start like hashing it out. You know, what if we did this or what if we put that before this or what? Oh, what if we said this and that or whatever? Hey, Mike, and, he's talking about you, you fuck ass. And then the final product theoretically is good. I haven't I haven't seen it yet, but felt good doing it but then when the next one comes down the pike i have this experience in my head i'm like oh i remember where i was when i was told here's what we're doing so uh, it's a yes have you heard of a woman named brene brown she's one of these kind of new thought people but she's she's a data collector she does a lot of ted talks mm -hmm. things like that i'd have um, to see a picture of her. it sounds familiar you i'm sure you've heard the name but she she has a podcast now and she again she does a lot of ted talks and she talks a lot about fft's and it seems so silly but it's so great to remember like in this instant an fft all it means is first fucking time mm -hmm. and when you right. start to feel nervous or confused or i can't do this i don't know what's going on you're like wait this is my first fucking time i'm having yep. an fft this is normal I, and once and oh once yeah it's over, it will never be this again I've seen her TED talk. Yeah, yeah, she's very interesting. She's a she's a data collector, but she's I, I like that. I like yes. remembering that. Yeah, it just it look it it's 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 either impossible if you've never done it, 
or if you have written a couple songs about your friend's huge dick, it just sure. comes naturally by the yeah. time the fourth song comes around. First time's a little intimidating. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, shall we do a little, uh, I think it's going to air on uh, Sunday on ABC or is it Saturday? NBC. On a, uh, it's a oh, Sunday okay. at seven on a, an NBC. Who is in that Maxipat? I know they, they're going alphabetically now, so <laughs> I, I get to be in there. <laughs> Let's see. We got Judd Apatow, Jack Black, Louis Anderson, Byron Allen. Well, that's the guy who's producing the thing. Yeah. Wayne Brady, Adam Carolla, Cedric the Entertainer, Margaret Cho, Andrew Dice Clay, Dion Cole, Billy Crystal, Whitney Cummings, Tommy Davidson, Bill Ingvall, Mike Epps, Bill, uh, Billy Gardell. Oh, yeah. Brad Garrett, Whoopi Goldberg, Tiffany Haddish, Kevin Hart. Geez, I'm going to get cut out of this thing for sure. <laughs> Kevin James, Jim. <laughs> Jim Jeffries, Jamie Kennedy, Keegan Michael Key, George Lopez, John Lovitz, Howie Mandel, Sebastian Maniscalco, uh, Mark Marin, Tim Meadows, Eddie Murphy, uh, Caroline Ray, blah, 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 Chris Rock, Adam Sandler, <laughs> Sarah Silverman, JB Smoove, Keenan Thompson, Cheryl Underwood, and Marlon Wayans. Start All right. the lead guest? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, am I going to get cut? All right, uh, should we play the game? Let's do, do it. it. Listen to that noise. That's a hundred percent in your voice. It can only mean one thing, and you can feel it. Got some names of flicks, and the game makes their picks. Get seen if it's rotten or fresh. If it gets an exact all right so last week we had rob lowe on the podcast and due to a busy week of shows we never got around to playing the rotten tomatoes game so oh, instead man. this week we're gonna take a look Take a look back at some of his Rotten Tomato scores. So don't Rob blow it. <laughs> well done. Starting with a lovesick waiter obsessed with a hospital intern is at the center of this surprisingly dark teen dramedy. But let's be honest. We we're all just waiting for Rob Lowe to bust out his saxophone. Joe Schumacher directs Emilio Estevez, Andrew McCarthy, Demi Moore, Judd Nelson, and Ali Sheedy. And the great John Parr sang, sang the theme song to 1985's St. Elmo's Fire. Hey, man in motion. Well, this is the song tool is tune of movies. I will yeah. never change this if it's on. <clears throat> it, it, such, it's, it's embodied the 80s. I've never seen um, this. <clears throat> you should just to kind of see how people dressed, what all the styles were and like, what the milieu was or whatever like it's so 80s and yeah. and for me it, you said this was 85 was it did you say dawson stand by or 80 early 80s tell you what i appreciate it is 85 yeah. yes oh uh, what i appreciate about the, about the poster is everyone's name is under the right person yeah that's yes. helpful uh you should watch it just because it'll when people reference it you'll uh -huh, uh -huh. you'll know what they're talking about but also you gotta, I was, in 1985, I lived in a upstairs apartment with three dudes in North Hollywood on a futon with no air conditioning, like right off of Laurel Canyon, just in the San Fernando Valley. I was just working construction out in the hot sun all day. And when I was, wa I'd watch movies like St. Elmo's Fire. I didn't even know where they were. Like, <laughs> I did not know what this was. Uh, trees and leaves and ivy on brick building and snow and weather and old you know saint elmo's pub that had been there since the, you know 1747 or something and you'd see all these ivy league buildings and college campuses and i was like what is this what i mean because for me it was all strip malls 7-eleven stucco boxes built in the 70s or 80s asphalt everywhere I, I couldn't even picture going off to college in a place where they had seasons and the leaves yeah. would change colors. It's so and romantic. It was crazy, right? Everyone's like good looking. And, and I, I, I'd watch St. Elmo's, Elmo's Fire and I'd go like, 
where did that dude get that jacket? Look <laughs> at that jacket. That's a big warm weather. That jacket must have cost him $60. <laughs> it was stupid. Yeah, I picked ticket item. <laughs> yeah, like we didn't have winter wear. We just had, yeah. you know, flip flops and tennis yeah, shoes. Good point. Wind All breakers. right. This is a fun movie that uh, cannot be well reviewed, but it doesn't mean it's in the, the 30s. Mm. I'm going to say 42. I'm playing it safe and going right in the middle of 55. Junior Whoa. said 55. I must have much more reverence for this time period. I think people love this shit. I said 73. Hmm, the passion runs deep, but the score does not. St. <laughs> Elmo's fire is rotten at 44%. Ooh. What did you have, Adam? 42. Damn. Two mm. years earlier. <clears throat> you, know, you, know, you know what this scene had in it? It had a lot. It had, it had the, every 80s movie had like the rich dad. Like when rich, when, and also like you knew, like now when someone's rich, they just, they just pull up in a Prius and the guy's wearing board shorts. Like we don't know, like the dad, the snobby rich guy with the <laughs> house, you know, the big home, right. big Tudor home. And they'd be sitting at the dinner table and he'd be like preaching, I want you to go out with Robbie. His family is well to do. They're well to do, you know, right. and they'd go, but dad, I don't love him. I don't love him. You'll learn you'll, to love him. You'll learn to love him. His family's very yeah. well respected. And arranged marriage. Right. And it was like, it was weird. It was like, I, I'd also sit around and go, is this what rich people do? Like big tables with candelabras and big fireplaces everywhere. Like it was rich and you do what we say. And we're, and of course, like everyone is miserable who's rich, but they're rich people and they need to marry the right people. And then of course there's always the guy from the wrong side of the tracks and we don't want him. We don't want him here. Every eighties movie had one of those rich guy theme things. Sorry, go ahead. Two years earlier, Rob Lowe was a co-star amongst one of the most handsome casts ever assembled. Patrick Swayze, Matt yeah. Dillon, oh Tom Cruise, God, right. Ralph Macchio, and once again, Emilio Estevez. Yeah. Based on a novel that a lot of people were forced to read in high school, Stay Golden, Pony Boy, from 1983, The Outsiders. Nothing gold can stay. Hmm. Now this had so some drama. I think it's Tom Cruise forgot his teeth fixed. This is uh, <laughs> you call me gay for writing songs about my buddy's hog in high school. How about you studying at the of the orthodonture of uh, Tom Cruise? <laughs> um, yeah. So Francis Ford Coppola. That's right. All right. They didn't like it, but there's a lot of good stuff there. A lot of fun. Oh, they had the so. Oh, Leif Garrett was a soch. He was. Right. Oh. Yeah, Leif Garrett was in this, and he was the rich. Well, remember, I was talking about the theme, rich guy, poor right. person, yeah, wrong side of the tracks. Yeah, this was supposed to take place in like the 60s or something, but Leif Garrett was a soch. I have um, no idea. All right. Um, the, the, not, nothing horrible about this movie, right? I don't know. This is one of those, is it because we saw it when we saw it movies? Yeah. Because of course we yeah. loved it. I knew this sucked in eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going with 57. Oh, same score again. 55. Back to wow. Barely fresh, 66. The Outsiders is barely fresh oh. at 63. Oh, I needed that. Well, there you go. For our next film, we're we'll turn to HBO. And before Brian complains that it isn't fair, let's all remember that Netflix movies win Oscars now. That's, That's true. Before Elton, oh, before yeah. Gaga, oh yeah, there was Liberace. This is one of my favorite movies ever. Michael Douglas, Matt Damon, <laughs> and Rob Lowe star in 2013's Behind the Candelabra. I, oh, I've theatrical release. I've seen this so many times. Pablo so was good. so good in this. He's yes, so he was good. amazing. I, uh, if people didn't get a chance to hear the Rob Lowe interview, it was one of the best interviews I've ever done because he's a delight. And um, I specifically brought this movie up and his acting in it. And he was so happy to hear just how amazing and comedic <laughs> and spot 
on he was he said he'd been following this movie um the development and you know he, he sees all the pages and everything and and he'd been following he just got a call to play that part but he was amazing this oh. movie's amazing and movie. it's why i i always i use this movie as an example of why you should ever you should never go oh i don't like so and so food just go in the restaurant and try it don't make your yeah. proclamations because mm -hmm. i knew this story very well right i have i had I have been to the Liberace Museum. I knew, <laughs> I knew the story about him and his young guy, young guy toy who was getting all the plastic surgery. And, and when I heard Michael Douglas and Matt Damon, and I just kind of looked at this, I was like, oh, come on. I mean, <laughs> this is going to be a shit show. And I love this movie. So It's fantastic. It's a perfect example of do not judge. Just watch the pro watch the finished project and and Rob Lowe too. I mean, amazing. Yep. All right, this is uh, fantastic, and there's no uh, and and there's no. Um, I don't think we have to deduct anything for sort of woke points or anything no. anything like that. It's got so it, it, it was it, and I th I think you don't if you get you cannot do this with races. Like you can't get a Jewish guy to play an American Indian. You're gonna get points deducted. Uh -huh. But you can have straight guys play gay guys and oh, actually yeah. get a few points. Mm. Yep. I don't know why the rules are the rules, but that's how the rules It's open-minded, man. Yeah. Right. No Iron Eyes Cody anymore. Right, so I am going to say 93. Ooh. Yeah, I, I may have gone a little low at 89. I think it's the Steven Soderbergh movie, if I remember correctly. 89 I think right. is, my, is my guess. I split the difference. By the way, my fiance does a dead on Michael Douglas as Liberace, tortures me with it all the time. He always goes, Hi, Scott. And it's really, really <laughs> terrifying. 91. Behind the Can Laura is certified fresh at 95. Okay, wow. good, as it should be. That is high. Dang. Rob Lowe. The people have it at 71. <laughs> That's <laughs> bizarre. No, but also, the, there's, there's people who just can't go with the gay stuff. Well, I, you I, know, I, I don't think this is a rumor. I think it's true. The reason why it didn't get a, mo a theatrical release is because people thought it's it, the, t the tones, no one would come to see this movie. I get these folks can't get down with the gay stuff, but I feel the same way about, you know, a war movie that's too violent. Like it's a war movie, mm -hmm. tough that's shit. That's what it parcel. is. Yep. That, that's Black Hawk Down is that. That's what it is. This is two guys making out in a jacuzzi. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Like don't, the, you can't deduct points because you disagree with the subject matter. Yeah, don't and you can't say it. goods, goods not as advertised. Look at the poster. <laughs> My God, I know. This poster's gayer than a guy who writes songs about his friend's huge hog in high school. I think it's what Liberace did. <laughs> Even Liberace probably didn't do yeah. what I did in high school. That's probably he has right. standards, Brian. Yeah. He's an artist. <laughs> yeah. He had standards and standards. Like That's he right. probably had both. That's <laughs> right. right. Rob Lowe plays a Hollywood super agent in this satire about the merchants of death who sell you alcohol, guns, oh, yeah. and cigarettes. Aaron Eckert leads a stellar ensemble cast in 2006's is Thank You for Smoking. I forgot about this movie. This was great. Yeah, this is a fun movie. Jason um, Reitman. Yeah. What is Reitman up to? He's, He's doing a remake of, or a remake, a sequel, I guess, to uh, Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters huh. Afterlife. It's supposed to come out this summer. Oh, really? Yes. There's a trailer mm. for it and everything. Mm. No idea. Yeah. Geez, I, I passed a billboard. I, I do want to get back to watching some goddamn movies. I think I, I passed a billboard for The Quiet Place, too. And I was like, oh, yeah. Or uh, is it A Quiet Place or The... A quiet place. A quiet place. A quiet place too. And I went, God damn it! I want to see some, some movies in a theater. Yes. Like I, I, Fast and Furious would have been upon us. Now yeah, this, this is getting is, to be too much. These are event movies supposed to be seen in theaters. I agree. All right. Uh, they love this. How much did they love it? Um, this to me is, is this eighty one or this could be ninety six. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, now, also, I'm going to tack on a few woke points here because we're kind of sticking it to the the man mm -hmm. on this one. Mm -hmm. The big tobaccos, as I recall. So I'm going to say 91. Same score, 91. 87. Thank you for smoking a certified fresh at 86%. It's a very tight game. I like this movie. Yeah, I did too. And finally, we couldn't overlook this Chris Farley classic. He and David Spade <laughs> hit the road to keep the family business on track while Rob Lowe is essentially a con man, Wiley Coyote, trying to sabotage and never quite succeeding. 1995's Tommy Boy. Now we're talking. Okay, this is one of my favorite comedies of all time, <laughs> and I don't know how far off I am with, like, out of touch with the public or not. I love David well, Spade and Chris Farley together. I love this movie. I laugh. I cry. It's Brian Dennehy. It's Rob Lowe. It's fantastic. The public or the critics? Because I guarantee you they're not the same <laughs> score. I love this movie. You saw this movie at the right age, exactly. I, I, I own this movie. I was a little bit older, but I still love, you know, I'm not a slapstick humor guy, but I do love it when they nail it. And yeah. the beginning of that film, when he like ripped a bong load and just went right down and blew up the, the coffee table. table. So goddamn funny, right? Yep. It's the best. It's, it's, yeah, made him a star. Yeah. Okay, that's gonna be tough. Um, it's so- It had a heart too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So this game, we're all knotted up here. I don't think we. I don't think there's more than four points that separate uh, the the top of the point, the gold from the bronze mm -hmm. right now. Maybe five points, but I feel like we're all really tight. And this movie is tough because we know it's you know we know it's not in the '80s, but critics can be tough on movies like this. I mean, this movie could be a mid '40s type oh, movie by by the critics i'm going to say is this fresh i'm gonna go 59 uh, a little lower 51 i'm i'm going against my heart because again i love this movie i said barely fresh at 62 mm, tommy boy is rotten come on at 42 percent i needed that, those eight oh, points oh, i needed that the people have it at 90. yeah that's what was my suspicion was it be really popular oh. amongst the people i did what i always do i said it could be a mid 40s mm -hmm. thing but god what I, can we stop being such snobs uh, about comedies they're really just there to make people laugh like they don't have to make people think they don't have to tell a great story it's just, if, if it's funny the worst review ever on a comedy it's like oh it had a lot of laughs but, but it's yeah. like but what, what do you want what i'm do sure you want? this is the i'm sure this is the exact movie they set out to make god this right is such a great movie fuck right. them yeah I hate this game gina grad yeah you shouldn't hate this game because you made the podium <laughs> oh thank you congratulations this is like I don't know how many games in a row but every <laughs> single time you are on the board and I believe your score might be the same year of the car that Rob Lowe drove in St. Elmo's Far. They got crushed in that alley. 57. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Brian. Hey. And Adam Carolla. Both of you guys are in the 30s. Ooh. Seven points separating close game. Adam Carolla, your score of 32. Well, I don't think I'm the seven ahead the of him. Strong. <laughs> <laughs> the strong. The strong. Oh, I did. I kind of fucked up the math on there. Okay. No, 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 you're probably perfect. right. Maybe, 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 maybe I just fucked up the math. Okay. Right. Made you think <laughs> I yeah. fucked up the math. Because Adam Carolla, your score of 32 is good enough to make the podium as well. Bald Brian. Yeah, let's hear it. 30. 31. Nine oh. times. 39 for second place. The ace man takes the crown. 
Well good. done. Well, that was a good, that was a good low scoring uh, uh, affair. The, the, the problem with the, the, look, it's the candle behind the candelabras. Those are easy. All the good movies are, are easy. It's the Tommy boys that are tough because we all look at, you know, we all go, oh, that movie was funny. I give it yeah. 80. And then you go, mm -hmm. I better deduct 20 and give it 60. But he better deduct another 18 <laughs> points for the goddamn yeah. critics. You're right. Yeah, Adam, rounds two through four, all of you scored single digits. Nice. Whoa. Each of your wow. All right, shall we take ourselves to break and come back and do the news with Bald and Gina Grad right after this? News with Grad, news with Gina Grad, breaking viral, all those crazy Trump tweets. Give me news with Gina Grad, trouble in the Middle East, celebrity drug meltdowns. Keep news with Gina, Gina Grad. The news with Gina Grad. So Joe Biden spent his Friday responding to 27-year-old sexual assault allegations made against him by Tara Reid, different Tara Reid, a former Senate staffer. And I'll just go right to the clip. Here's a clip of him on MSNBC's uh, show Morning Joe telling Mika Brzezinski that he didn't do it. And please, uh, to our viewers, please excuse the graphic nature of this. But I want to make sure that there is no question as to what we're talking about. She says in 1993, Mr. Vice President, that you pinned her against the wall and reached under her clothing and penetrated her with your fingers. Would you please go on the record with the American people? Did you sexually assault Tara Reid? No, it is not true. I'm saying unequivocally, it never, never happened. And it didn't. It never happened. I'm going to buy some land in Pennsylvania and just kind of become a shaker. I'm realizing, like, build wagon wheels all day and, like, smoke a pipe. Just like Get away from it all. Turn butter. I'm, an, I'm, the, I'm an atheist who hosted Loveline for 10 years, and I feel like we've just jumped the shark. Like, yeah. everybody's got their hand in somebody's pussy. The, the, the two guys <laughs> for president are both accused of grabbing pussies. Like, yeah. it's, it's, this, is, this is insane. And, you know, I always think about timing. So it's always like you think about – as it pertains to sort of the legal system or, or a sort of like, oh, we're going to make an example of that guy. Uh, Minka, is it Minka? Does Minka, her name I right? think. M-I-K-A. Mika Brzezinski. Yeah. Mika drilled the shit out of Biden. Like she just fucking won after him. Good. And, she, and, she should do. Right. But I mean, he, you know, he goes there because he thinks, okay, this is a friendly place to go. And she goes berserk on him, good. Which, is, which is good, which is fine. But here's the interesting thing as you think about it from a timing standpoint. She or she or they or whatever, mainstream, they were sort of accused of like, oh, you're not going hard enough on Biden. You're not, you're not going hard on Biden. You went hard on Kavanaugh. You're right. ignoring Biden. So then... She does this interview with him and he goes to a place that he thinks of friendlier waters, but she has to overcompensate and prove to everyone, no, we're not going softer. So he then gets a worse shake. If he'd mm. gone over to Fox, he would have gotten <laughs> less grilling than MSNBC because she has to overcompensate for being, so you're not a journalist. You didn't even bring this up until blah, blah, blah. So she went nuts on him. I'm sure everyone was expecting softball questions from her, or at least, at least a, a friendlier, you know, tone or approach or whatever. And she brought it. She brought it, man. When do you think Biden or someone from Biden's camp is going to say, "Look, maybe he did, maybe he didn't," but it doesn't seem like the American public really gives a shit about that kind of thing anymore. You <laughs> that know, would be a bold know? strategy, Cotton. But that's what I'm saying. It's like we, we're playing this, you know, sort of game in a way because we already have a president. It's like, yeah, so. So yeah, I don't, do it, we care or don't we? No, we don't. We don't. We don't care. Mm -hmm. That's I don't. crazy. Um, yeah. Well, some uh, happier news. Uh, a bit of a surprise to some. Jerry Seinfeld returns to stand up on Tuesday tomorrow. As you hear this, his first comedy special in two decades will stream on Netflix. It's called uh, Jerry Seinfeld 23 Hours to Kill. They paid him $100 million for the rights to his NBC sitcom the series uh, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee and this new hour-long wow. stand-up special he, that's according to The Hollywood Reporter. He is like 
one of these, you know, when you hear about like the estate of Elvis Presley or the estate of Michael Jackson made X amount, like right. after he died, mm -hmm. he Seinfeld's like that, but he didn't die. He's, he's getting alive. it back. Fucking right. sitcom went off the air and he's made $200 million every year since the thing yeah. went off the air. Like it's supposed to go off the air and then you're supposed to go out and do <laughs> local dates. You're not supposed to just keep <laughs> printing money. Open supermarkets. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the thing, like comedians cars getting coffee it's like that show was literally created because he didn't feel like working like i like driving cars i like talking to, to norm mcdonald just right. put a fucking gopro in that uh Duesenberg and let's just yeah. cruise around and talk oh and i like coffee like yeah. it's really like a hundred million dollars to do what we would all love to do all day which is go find a super funny you know contemporary comedian who yeah. we go way back with and just have a good time Shoot and have some shit. coffee. Yeah. Well, I pulled a clip from the trailer. It seems like something that uh, it's, it's on brand. It's patented Seinfeld. I think you'll enjoy it. It's all things we do to convince ourselves our lives don't suck. And I know that because I know that everyone's life sucks. Your life sucks. My life sucks too. Perhaps not quite as much. <laughs> Never feel bad that your life sucks. The greatest lesson you can learn in life, sucks and great are pretty close. You go to a baseball game, you have a hot dog. The hot dog is cold. The bun is not toasted. The vendor is an ex-con in a work release program. You love that hot dog every time. Does it, does it suck? Yes. Is it great? Yes. That's how close they are. I say to you that sucks are great are the exact same thing. You have an ice cream cone, you're walking down the street, the ice cream falls off the top of the cone, hits the pavement, sucks. What do you say? Great. <laughs> so Seinfeld. Yeah, we're working on uh, the, his buddy, writer uh, Barry, Barry who does Barry Martyr, who does all those cars and coffee and stuff. And uh, Seinfeld as well. We're working on a doc of his uh, letters from a nut with Seinfeld and those guys. So we're just kind of getting started on that, but uh, more to come. Nice. Fantastic. Yeah. Not well, quite the payday he's uh, enjoying over on Netflix, <laughs> but okay. Doing all right. When I saw that special with Ray, uh, we went to some benefit years ago, Randy Wang and I for Seinfeld, Ray Romano and Jason Alexander were the three, uh, you know the, the the three comedians and of course we were there to see Seinfeld we couldn't wait but Ray Romano actually ended up just blowing my mind and I remember at the end there was a Q&A and Jason Alexander was hosting it and said to Seinfeld like why do you you know why do you have 50 you know multi-million dollar cars you don't need 50 core you know Jaguars or whatever he has and he goes I don't need one expensive car. <laughs> right. But here we are you know he he enjoys and sort of doesn't apologize for it. And he bought Porsche race cars and that, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different ways you can go with a car. You can be a rapper and go out and get yourself a brand new Lamborghini Huracan and then have it wrapped in some sort of satin gray, whatever. And the car you paid 275,000 bucks for will be worth a buck 50 in two and a half years. Like mm. that's, you can that's go that direction. You can buy a, a, you know, classic car, a Duesenberg or a Woody or an old Corvette or something, buy it and have it just sort of like incrementally go up over the years, like a T-bill or something. Like an investment, yeah. Right, but if you bought the right race cars, especially Porsche race cars, like stuff that ran Le Mans in the 70s and stuff like that, you made a huge return on your investment. I mean, literally, you know, he's probably, I don't know if he has a 917. You can check that out, Max Pat. I know he did. He probably does. I mean, his 917, he could have paid $4 million for, but it could be $27 million today. Yeah. Like, Who do you think has a more savvy. expensive collection? Steve Martin's paintings or Jerry Seinfeld's cars? God, that's a good question. I don't know enough about paintings to to know, I though know. I know they go bananas. And Bald Brian, buckle up. It's your I was talking to um Farley, Farley uh, cousin oh, yeah, yeah, runs yeah. runs Ford, right. and he was telling me that Axel Rose had one of the most significant 
Ford race car collections. Really? Yeah, I always think about those guys like 80, late 80s, early 90s, like they had publishing royalties at the right time. Like it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean as much now, but like if you're fucking Axl Rose and you have, you wrote, co-wrote or co-wrote all the songs on one of the biggest selling albums of all time, you, you, you really don't have to work if you don't, if you don't really want to. What? Uh, yeah. So maybe Max Paddock and look, I know, I knew nothing of that, but uh, yeah. All right. Rich, keep getting richer. Yep. <laughs> Well, NBC News reports that all schools and colleges in New York State will remain closed for the rest of the academic year. That's according to Governor Cuomo. He said the decision was made to keep the state's millions of students, I think it is about 4 million students, and teachers safe during this pandemic. Uh, that goes for public and private schools. Colleges all switched to distance learning in mid-March. Remote learning will continue at schools. They still are undecided on summer school because those programs should actually be starting, you know, within a month or so, and they don't know exactly what they're going to do with that yet. I think this is going to bite them in the ass because I think a lot of people aren't going back. You, you learn from home for three weeks, you'll go back. You do it for seven months, you might not go back. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. a lot of people are going like, I don't need the housing. I don't need, you know, you could live in an apartment in Indiana and save a lot of money and take classes at NYU. Or where, or where, or wherever in Boston, or whatever yeah. else. Well, and to your point, uh, the chief executive of Barclays has come to a conclusion that we're talking about right now. A lot of employers are thinking about this. Big offices might not be part of the business future plan. After yeah. seeing how well people are working from home, companies could be less willing to deal with expensive offices, big skyscrapers. When all this blows over, and Jess Staley, he's the CEO of Barclays, told reporters last week that the notion of putting 7,000 people back in the same building may be a thing of the past. Well, think about the concept that I, I like experienced when I went to the campus of Pixar so many years ago. Um, you see everyone on that campus. So, so big tech, Google and, and Pixar and all, all these places just started doing this different form of, of employment. So when we were growing up, it was like Hudsucker proxy kind of stuff. Like, yeah, we had a cubicle, the guy, the big guy at a corner office and, uh, you know, like when I grew up, it'd be like, I when I was like working, like I was at McDonald's or on a construction site or something, I'd be like, I got to go to the bathroom, go at lunchtime, finish your shift. You know what I mean? Like you couldn't sit down. There was no personal devices, phone calls or information or any. I mean, if you picked up a newspaper, they tell you, put it down, you know, but then at a certain point, you go to Pixar, it's like people are eating free food. They're playing foosball. They're, they're walking scooters. around. They're out there. Oh, they got an archery team set up out in the yard, yeah. out, the, out on the grounds. And so work became like, well, you don't have to work, but you have to get your shit done. Right. And, and, and you have to kind of do it on, on your timetable. Mm -hmm. And we got the food and you got the bathroom. We got the games and we got the whatever. Then if you think about it, once the smartphone kicked in, it was over because the smartphone, like I used to go to work and it'd be like, you don't get to have your TV shows. You don't get to have your information. You don't get to have your, your whatever it is. You're at work. Mm -hmm. When you're done with work, you can go back and watch your TV shows On or your read time. your stuff or talk to who you want to talk to, but yeah. not here. Well, now the smartphone gave everyone access to everything all the time. So you're checking your Roto League or your fantasy football, you call your wife, your husband, whatever, friend, text. Blah, blah. Once the phone started showing up to work, then we're all kind of on the honor system at that point right. to get your work done because the distraction part is there. And now the boss is paying for the food in the mm -hmm. bathroom and all that and all that kind of stuff. So it's like, wait a minute, you're just going to use the bathroom or you want to graze and eat some food and all you have to do is get your work done. Let's just do it from home. I'm not yeah, going to have yeah. to buy a parking structure. Why yeah. are they spending so much money to make it feel like you're at home with the food and the games and the whatever, the well, breaks or whatever? What, they, they could save all that money and just work from home. But that's the pendulum swinging the other way because kind of to your point, you know, you think of Google and you think of all these places and the whole point was to keep you there and as much of you there as mm -hmm. long as possible. There's gyms at your complex, you know, at, your, at the Google complex. There's babysitting, there's daycare. There's, you never have to go home again. And we have our own grocery store. And now it, the pendulum has completely swung. Stay home. We don't want to pay for this. Yeah, well, I mean, think about 
obviously when I was swinging a hammer, you had to show up. You just had to show up. There's no virtual anything. They're, they're jobs where you operate equipment and, or your babysitter, or whatever you work, you work the grill at McDonald's. I mean, there's like physical manufacturing, right. whatever, like you have to show up, but I don't know, ideas and websites and, and meetings and stuff. Do you really physically need to be there? And the answer is, Definitely not. Like we could change. You know, I think it's kind of interesting. We 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 kind of did this model where we're like, we need efficient, rapid transit. We need subways and rails. These commuters have to get in, but no one ever thought, well, maybe maybe they don't need to get in at all. Right. Like we're doing it. Obviously, in LA, it's a freeway system that's backed up. It's bumper to bumper. So everyone's like, we need a rail system. It's like maybe we don't need a rail system. Right. Maybe people can stay, stay home and do this at, at do it in their own home. And by the way, do not think this isn't going to be factored in in new construction. Oh yeah. So when they're building a whole bunch of lofts in downtown LA. There will not be a mud room, but there will be a media room. You know, the, the <laughs> right. thing will have a camera hardwired on it already. Right. It'll be laid out. That'll be your workspace from home. Yes. Fred. That's interesting. Do you guys, have you guys heard that, uh, this is very local news, but Google is opening a headquarters just down the street from me at the old West Side Pavilion Mall at Pico and Overland. And this is, there couldn't be a more... Uh, in flux time, right? For yeah, like, actually, this is a mat. This used to be a mall, for God's sake. And they're turning into offices. Like, how how are they going to? I'm sure they can figure out a way. But I'm saying, would it be prudent to fill those offices? I don't know. I I keep looking at radio where we all come from. I keep looking at that big building on Mid Wilshire and that huge mm -hmm. parking structure behind it, and I keep thinking, man, that is a lot. Of cubic feet and real estate and air conditioning and maintenance and security and taxes and everything do you know do we need that huge footprint i mean we're all just sitting at home broadcasting now yep. and everyone cars in their garage no one, well, and, no one and even your, started it to your point about factoring it in i wonder if it'll be factored into salary negotiations you know you're not spending that money anymore and i'm providing my own tech and office or whatever i wonder if that's going to start being a thing of the future Whatever it is, the jobs that we had in, in, at the turn of the century were, you know, school teacher and cop and trash, trash man and factory worker. And every single person that worked in a Ford factory had to show up at a Ford factory. And all the guys that were putting everything together on the floor had to show up. And then their managers and supervisors and everyone above them had to show up as well we're not manufacturing anything anymore. Like we're, mm -hmm. these are ideas. These are, this is all digital. This is code. Like we're not really physically us putting things together. We don't need to assemble anything anymore. We, yes, there are places like Ikea and I guess we're going to need a, a, a building with a roof on it where stuff can be right. and be shipped to us or we can go pick it up. But most of us, I mean, let's, let's, let's break let's let's think about it we're not exactly the prime demo but think about you your spouse people you know who really needs to head in well further complicating thing i'll just well there's another wrinkle just another wrinkle to the story so christy works uh, we mentioned the building in wilshire christy works across the street at the sbe building the really tall the tallest one yeah, that's, that's on the wilshire the yeah, the, the, the Wilshire stretch. And uh, they're, they're having conversations now about reopening the office, letting people back in, blah, 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 at some point, you know, down the road, sometime in May or something. And Christy's like, I don't want to go back in. Like, I'm get, I get everything done here. That's a dangerous, that, that, that's too many people. Too many people, they're all using the same elevators, all using the same valet, you know, they hand the keys to the guy, the same guy grabbing all the keys. It's like, I don't want to go in. And, so I'm, and I'm like, I don't blame you. You can get everything done from here. Well, and that's funny because you do hear that a lot and people are absolutely adjusting. And my thought for whatever reason is, oh, but I like going into work. I like the change of scenery. I like seeing the people, yeah, agreed. you know, so well, it, it would be tough to have to do all this from home. You know, I like that. I still go into work for, you know, I still go to KFI every night. I'm the only one there. Either way, now more than ever, folks, you are going to have to be in control of your own shit. Yep. 
because work forced you to shave and get dressed and get up and get over and, you know, whatever. And if everyone's going to be putzing around their sweatpants now, we're really going to have to keep a tight check on ourselves. Oh, I'm 100% doing full newscasts in Market 2 with my bra strap showing. So <laughs> I've, uh, that ship sailed long ago for me. Seinfeld bought his 917 chassis 022 in 2002. So I already know he's made eight million bucks on that thing. He bought it on a used car lot. What does that even mean, Max and Pat? How did he buy it on a used car lot? Like that, that, uh, now? Yeah, that's what he's. That's what he said in his tweet. Yeah, he um, doesn't so mean it. He doesn't mean that football. Uh, it's uh, Steve McQueen's Porsche from uh, Le Mans. I guess it was the one that was used. The one, maybe the hero car that Steve McQueen drove. Wow. At uh, Le Mans, you know, famously, I think they took a GT40, which was you know the Ford v Ferrari movie. That's the Ford GT40. Now, when they shot Le Mans, like 69 or 70 or whatever, they shot Le Mans, Ford had won. The GT40s were super competitive in 66, 67, 68. But by the time they got to 69 or 70, they weren't competitive anymore. The Porsche 917 was dominant. Mm -hmm. So they took a GT40 that they could have got cheap and they hacksawed the roof off it and made it into a camera car. That's, oh, wow. That's, that's genius. Because you need a, a 200 yeah, yeah. mile an hour car to stay up with the Porsche. With the race car, sure. But the Porsches were super expensive because they were brand new. And this was yesterday's race car that wasn't competitive anymore. And there was no vintage market. Wow. So I was like, take it, hack the roof off. I think Max and Patty, you can probably find a picture of that GT40 with the roof hacked off. But, um, but uh, it was in a used car lot. Really? Yeah. The How? It uh, couldn't Spike be. Spike Fairston saw it in a showroom in L.A. on Wilshire Boulevard in oh. 2002. Well, the so. showroom on Wilshire Boulevard, I know what you're talking about. That's a super high-end. I don't think we call <laughs> yeah, it that used car. It wasn't a junkyard. You might be technically right. correct, but that's not what we're all thinking of. Right. It was, uh, I know that place. That place was across from the Red Lobster, I think. What? Where's and Red on Wilshire, there used to be a Red Lobster, and there used to be a corner... There used to be a corner, used to be a bank, and they put a bunch of super high-end mm. cars in there, and it was like a super huh. high-end show. Another thing that's going to go the way of the dodo, who's going to pay for that kind of real estate when everything's online? Yep. So, yeah, that's where we're heading. Just because like now I can't get it out of my head, what was the movie, was it a movie you showed us with no sound, and when it had sound, it, we thought the car was going much faster? Remember yeah. that? Cl it's, what it's was called, that? It's called Rendezvous. Thank you. That was and it was, it was a very, it, it's a very interesting, there's two interesting experiments. Uh, when you watch Rocky or another boxing film and you're, and you're watching it at home and you have the sound cranked up, it's super exciting and every punch lands. And when you turn the sound all the way down, you'll see the punches missing. Miss. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because they weren't physically hitting each other, right. but you didn't see the gap, the sound connected it for you. So, right. And there was this story. So there's this famous film, bootleg film of a guy who mounted up a camera car. And he, no, he took a camera and he mounted it down low and he drove through um, Paris at, at dawn, or, you know, 6 a.m. And he was hauling ass and blah, blah, blah. And the legend was some guy took a Ferrari Daytona. They never said who the guy was. They never showed the car. They just showed the POV of like the front bumpers. It tore through the, the streets of Paris. And at some point, the story came out that the guy was like a film producer or director. And they added the sound of a Ferrari V12 through the whole thing. And it made it so fast. But they're now thinking he may have just been driving like his wife's station wagon, <laughs> filmed it and then laid that sound over it. When you lay the sound over it, it turns into a totally different experience. Thus, when I talk to my guys, and I'm driving my 935 <laughs> Porsche up Lord March's driveway, stop with the generic ZZ Top music, put in the sound of the engine, because it turns it into a completely different experience. And when you watch it without 
sound, it slows it right. down. And we watch it with the sound, it speeds it up. That's right. Well, we're talking about all the benefits of working from home, but we know there are some pitfalls because we keep talking about them in the, mo the news, whether you're doing a newscast with no pants on or your uh, lady friend who's not really your lady friend walks by during one of your shots. Well, there's another one. Um, this latest one is University of Miami professor John Pang Zhang, who was fired this month after accidentally sharing uh, with students his X-rated penchant for busty college girls. All this right. is according to uh, New York, uh, the New York Post. There yeah. it is. There's his tab open. This was discovered by administrators after students just saw it and went crazy sharing the video on social media and when they were doing this Zoom screen share, uh, doing a business analytics instruction class. Uh, a student called the attention to the bookmark during the class, but Zhang allegedly just continued with the lesson as if it didn't during happen. Class. Within during a few class. hours, eight seconds of the video evidence, uh, which was on Zoom, was shared on TikTok like 800,000 times, 800,000 views. Zhang followed up in an email telling students he was investigating the ordeal and asked uh, yeah. students to please stop sharing it and he's since resigned. I'm going to investigate for the next couple hours. <laughs> well, <laughs> Don't bother me. You know, we're going to have to re rethink a few laws uh, or whatever, because if you're bringing in a magazine into the on campus called, you know, busty college girls and sharing them with students or whatever, Passing but out. this is kind of you at home, you, you know, yeah. like, what do we do with this stuff? Yeah. My, uh, my, my sister was telling me that my uh, youngest nephew was taking an online class in super hard porn, just pow, like just pow all over it. <laughs> super like, and my sister was like, what kind of porn? And he was like, I didn't want to talk about it. like <laughs> crazy novelty made to upset everybody. <laughs> Boom. Because Wait, coming from the teacher's computer. No, somebody had, there's a lot of people just hacking into oh, stuff. Yeah, oh yeah, the Zoom bombing. And yeah. they're just coming in yeah. with Tourette's <laughs> like scat porn. Tourette's scat porn. And uh, look, the whole idea is how outrageous can you be? Oh, sure, yeah. sure. And you can That's be pretty joking. damn outrageous if you have uh, access to a computer and you know your way around. And by the way, these kids all grew up with a computer. Right. They this know what time. they're doing. This, this is, is their time. easy for them. And they're dealing with a bunch of 40-year-old, you know, teachers who really don't know it as well as yep. they know it. Yep. And yep. They, there's just a ton of this going on. Oh, Do you okay. think the professor is in more trouble because it was specifically college porn? Yeah. Or because otherwise, are you are you porn shaming the guy? Like the guy's allowed like a porn. He's an adult it's, male. It's funny you should ask. I, I cut this part out just because it's a long article and they went through, you know, a million different angles, but they did ask some of the students and some of the girls were like, like if it would have been anything else, okay, but like, I don't want to go to this guy's class now. I feel weird. So it, it did come up in the article. No safe spaces. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, un the unfortunate part of that thing is definitely college and his yeah. association with it. That's, that's, so is he gone? Is he fired? He, he resigned. I, <laughs> he I resigned. imagine there was some uh, pressure to do that. Sexy economic students. <laughs> <laughs> We're not quite. Business at... analytics. <laughs> Genius. We're not quite at the point <laughs> <laughs> where you point. could just claim it, you're hacked for everything now, but we're yeah. getting there, right? Yeah. 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 Like there's no, pretty soon, if there's a picture of anyone naked on the internet, you can go, that's not me. That's deep, someone else's body. They just took deep my face and they, yeah. Yeah. right. Yep. That's your they can do it with Bill defense. Hader and whoever else. It's pretty impressive. Right. Uh, so speaking of cars, NASCAR planning to get back in business on May 17th with a Cup Series race at Darlington Raceway in South Carolina, which is one of four it hopes to run without fans during the month of May. So if they pull this off, racing will be the first major sport to return to competition since all this quarantine started. You know, it's and what's funny. what's being in your own car? It's funny. A lot of race or NASCAR racetracks already paint all the seats to look like there's an audience in there how have you ever seen that i don't it doesn't come no. to mind well like if you look at a nfl stadium all the seats are just like blue or Green. red or yeah. whatever sure they make them all different colors so it looks oh. kind of like there's a bunch of people there wearing different color t-shirts it gives your mind 
like an illusion interesting that it's filled up even if there's nobody in there which it, they're not painting faces or anything on seats they just paint it so it looks it'll give the illusion of that there's that there's a crowd Stop. there yeah, yeah. Like, like you can find chris will find pictures i don't know if daytona's that way or talladega's that way but some of those big tracks are or more modern or refurbished tracks i guess we're done with that mind. So you still kind of get a little bit of that illusion, especially if you're blowing past it 200 miles an hour. Well, yeah, I was, we, yeah, I was talking to someone yesterday about NASCAR coming back. And then I was also talking to some of these guys who I was filming this Byron Allen thing for with all the crazy regulations for filming when they go back into production, mm. like oh. how much, oh yeah is going to how many rules there are going to be when they come back and start getting back into film production and how that's going to affect the actual acting and actors there's not mm. going to be a tight one shot you know they're gonna be standing on uh, separate parts of the couch you know one on each side interesting well hopefully we'll get some i don't know herd immunity or something i i i'm 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 optimistic um, um also, yes. I don't remember. Oh, oh there we go. There. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you're it's looking at a. And... Yeah, there's there's versions that even have, yeah, even more colors to it. But you can't tell. It sort of looks like a full a full yeah. stadium. Yeah. Just totally. a glance for sure. Yeah. And I don't know if we talked about it here or not, but what about just digitally adding a crowd, or would that be distracting? I I I I think if I was watching at home, just like when you watch. I guess when you watch uh, on any given Sunday or something, and maybe they digitally beef up the crowd or do mm -hmm. something like that on the sports movies, like, yeah, eh, that, then why yeah, not? We're used to it. Shot. Yeah. Uh, officials in Sw the Swedish city of Lund have spread chicken manure all over their central park to keep people away. And there's a, there's a great punchline to this story. This keeps residents from violating their social distancing rules if they choose to celebrate um, a holiday called Walpurgis Night on Thursday, because people apparently uh, congregate on the lawn and have a good time. A city council member said, we get the opportunity to fertilize the lawns, and at the same time, it will sink in. Oh, it will stink. And so it may not be nice to sit in the park and drink a beer, which oh. apparently they're allowed to do and we're not. Yeah, uh, you know, the, it sounds like the Swedish model may be working big picture. I, they, they, they're going to start off like everyone's always like, well, they had more deaths at the beginning. It's like, of course they did. That's, that's how it works if you mm -hmm. want to go down that road. But I right. think when this whole thing shakes out, maybe they can avoid this second wave that everyone is talking about. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad that Sweden did what Sweden did just so we have an A and a B, just right. so we have some nation to study. That's all. And mm -hmm. also when they're sitting in those outdoor cafes and they're two tables apart having a beer, mm -hmm. I go, eh, I feel like we could do that. In Pasadena. Feels doable. Yeah. All right. Let's do one more, Gina Grant. You got it. Well, everybody's on to the meal kits and, and you know, for all the lazy grub hubbers uh, who don't want to feel so lazy, there might be a nice little compromise for you. As a ramp up to Cinco de Mayo, Taco Bell is now offering an at-home taco bar kit. Mm. For 25 bucks, you get your shells, you get your tortillas, some nacho chips, some beef, some lettuce, refried beans, cheese, all the stuff. And you just put it together yourself so you feel like a little home, little home Taco Bell chef. And you can get these delicious. Delivered, you can get it at the drive-thru and then uh, you know it'll give you another 15 minutes of something to do it's impossible your own taco. let me give you like one of my impossible got it got to pack on the pounds sitting home i was like in my office it was like saturday night i had a couple uh glasses of uh whiskey i had a little buzz going all of a sudden i got i got natalia's out in the jacuzzi having fun um all of a sudden McDonald's shows up and I'm like, God, McDonald's. And it's like, I opened the bag at the front door and the fries oh, like French hit me fries, in the yeah. face. Best and I got, smell. I got a little of that 10, 15 Saturday night buzz going. As I reach in, I grab a couple of fries. I'm like, all right, all right. I bring it out to Natalia and then like I set it down and I'm like starting to walk back in and she's like, 
uh, they gave us an extra cheeseburger. Oh, and I'm like, of course they did. Give well, me that goddamn cheeseburger. <laughs> I didn't remember eating it. But I was like, I haven't eaten a McDonald's, just a regular <laughs> McDonald's Basic. cheeseburger, just flat out ketchup and cheese. I haven't eaten one of those in like 31 years. Yeah. Uh, goddamn, I polished that thing off. It, How was it? You don't yeah, remember. It tasted exactly like a McDonald's cheese. No, I don't really remember. But at the time, I remember thinking, this tastes exactly like the ones I used to make yeah. at McDonald's yeah. in 1980. Exactly but, uh, like the one Jimmy pinned to the wall for a year? That was uh, Canadian bacon. Oh, that's Come right. on, Gina. Come on, Gina. <laughs> I knew it was McDonald's. <laughs> All right. Let me hit uh, better help here. Looks like Phil's cleared out. Better help. Struggling with anxiety isolation or depression right now you're not alone everyone's going through this stuff well look it, it's a new world order and you're gonna have to uh make the shift sort of like working from home um better helps online licensed professional counselors who specialize in depression anxiety relationships sleep anger self-esteem and more mental health so important again you're not going out to the fields of the factory anymore it's all up in your head you want to get stuff done you got to get your head straight simply fill out a questionnaire it assesses your needs you get matched under 24 hours easily schedule secure video or phone sessions plus exchange unlimited messages it is better help you got to get some help these days let's do it with better help right dawson adam carolla show listeners will get 10 percent off their first month with discount code carolla that's betterhelp.com slash carolla why not get help betterhelp.com slash carolla all right uh should we bring it home with gina grad you got it i'm gina grad and that's the news gina, gina, that was the news with gina grad i'm gonna talk to uh john j lennon from uh, sing sing <laughs> In awesome. prison, Barry Andy's became a become a journalist, kind of interesting, or a columnist at, at least. We'll talk to him. This recorded call is from an inmate at a California correctional facility. Oh yeah, there is a little bit of that. I will uh, <laughs> I will prime you for that. Um, all right, and I will. Uh, should I wrap it up here, Max Pat, or do I wrap it up at the end uh, with John from Sing Sing? You wrap it up with John. Oh okay. Thanks, guys. We'll take a break and uh, we'll come back with the uh, actual inmate who's in for life for murder right after this. Um, I spoke to John on his podcast. I, I found him to be fascinating and uh, I thought we'd have him on so you guys could hear what he has to say. So, John, we'll talk all about the writer and the podcast and the journalism and all that. But first, a, a little background on you. You're in Sing Sing. How long have you been in there? So I've been in prison uh, for, go I'm on my 19th year of incarceration. You don't just like go to one prison. You know, first, you, first you go on Rikers Island and then you go back and forth to court. You fight your case and then, then you get sentenced and you go upstate. And, and you get into more trouble and you bounce around in different prisons and <laughs> and then you finally land in a prison where you uh, start getting your, your, your act together. For me, that was Attica and now Sing Sing. Attica, is Sing Sing one of the oldest prisons in the country? Sing Sing is the second oldest prison in New York. I would probably say the country too because we started doing the prison thing uh, early on in this nation in New York. Uh, so Auburn is the first the oldest, but Sing Sing is, it's, it's an old joint. I'm up on the fifth tier of these uh, Corona swirling uh, and this fucking B block, and uh, it's, it's one of the, uh, the largest cell blocks in the nation, so. Are there, are there people in there that have been released beca because of the coronavirus? Not in prison, Adam, not in prison, uh, uh, in jail. It's a good question, you know, because I was just, in a piece I was writing for a, for a magazine, uh, I was unpacking that. I was like, you know, it's interesting. People are, you know, let, let the prisoners go. I mean, you want to, I mean, it's, it's a little unfair to be in a place, I guess, when you think of releasing people from jail, where uh, they haven't yet been convicted, but they're in a place where the, the, the virus is spreading at a, you know, an alarming rate. But when you think of releasing people from, you know, from jail, because they haven't yet been, been convicted, most of, most of the time, they, they, you know, they get it right. You know, 
I'm not gonna say all the time, but most of the time they get it right. But those people, I mean, they're, they're kind of closer to criminality than you would think somebody that's been in prison 20 years is. They've kind of aged out of crime, and you'd probably be better off letting a guy go that's got 20 years in prison and uh, has chilled out for a while. Well, that's an interesting point, meaning it's like somebody is active, somebody in jail, that's somebody who's in the game. You know, that, that guy's still out there playing in the game, so to speak, right. whereas you've been, retired, you've been retired for a few years, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good but I've not only been retired, but I've gotten into a different game, a legal game. I've become a journalist and, and, a, and a writer you know, and, and now a podcaster. Uh, thanks for uh, podcast one and my, and my manager. Yeah. Um, so what is, give me a day for you. What What is a general day for you in Sing Sing and the, the cell block you're in? Sure. So let's just take today. Today I, had, uh, I did some revisions on a piece that I have a deadline on for the New Yorker. Uh, later today, uh, what officer was working uh, in the afternoon when I come to the yard, I'm in a cage with 23 other uh, guys with me using the phone 18 inches away from them. Uh, so they're both social distancing. Uh, so, um, and I had a gauge like what officer was going to be on. And it turns out the worst one is on, like the phone every 15 minutes. So, well, so yeah, I but. I had a Corolla every 15 minutes. Every, and now, now I got 60 seconds. So, it's a whole bunch of that, right? It's like you get up in the morning, you try to be a journalist while you're in, in Nathan Sing Sing, and there's all these red lights uh, that you hope, but you hope to catch the green lights, but you, you, know, you often are stuck at red. So for me, it's that. That's what it is for me. It's just, you know, I get up in the morning, uh, I put some coffee on in my cell, um, and I, you know, I do some re revising, I, I do some, you know, sort of for my podcast, and then, you, and then when the cells crack, you run to the phone in the yard, and you and you dodge a few, uh, a little of this and a little of that. And you hope you get a phone, and you hope you hope things go well. There's, when when do they crack the cell doors? So what I'm referring to is you could you could go out to you could put down some chow. You, things are optional in prison. You can stay in your cell, especially these days because there's no program. You know, because non-essential civilians have been sort of told to stay home. But the prison, interestingly, I'm watching right now, as I look at the prison, I'm watching I got absolutely no mask, no social distancing, no nothing. It's just, uh, I'm watching it from the keys, um, and it's just guys playing soccer, just, you know, hanging out, guys jogging, little basketball going on, there's guys in a, in a weight pit over on the other side of the yard. How, how, how does it break down... Uh, ethnically, are, are groups all kind of staying together like they used to, or is there more commingling? That's a, that's a good question. I got I got to drop the phone. I'll answer that question when I come back. Okay. Uh, give, me like, I'll, I'll, uh, give me like give me like ninety seconds. All right. All right. I'll fill the bus. All right. All right. This is the red light I'm talking about. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll hit you back. All right. So John is oh, in a. Know situation where he gets x amount of time on the phone and then they they cut him off now when i did his podcast we had about a straight half hour just straight through um but evidently it's it, it goes both directions a little bit and it's not as consistent and i guess what he's saying is is it kind of depends which guard you get on if you if you got a sort of i don't know we i mean haven't we all been through that with school you know what I mean? Like everyone had the cool PE teacher and the super strict PE teacher. There's Mr. Nelson, the cool one. He was the, I think a cousin of Ricky Nelson at uh, Walter Reed Elementary. And then there was Mr. Walters and he was super uptight. And there was Mr. Saponzi and he was super uptight. So there's just stuff you could do with Mr. Nelson that you couldn't do with Mr. Walters or Mr. Saponzi. So I'm guessing prison is just one big version of Walter Reed Elementary phys ed. Um, so when I was talking to John and, and it's something I want to make a note to get into with him is, you know, we were talking about punishment and how, how that's meted out and how that should work. And I was sort of drilling down on how my brain works with punishment. There's people I don't want in prison. I don't want 
people with a pot plant in their backyard or Lori Lachlan. I don't want her in prison. I don't want anyone who's not dangerous to society in prison. And then I start getting into this other strata, which is the Menendez brothers. The Menendez brothers were dangerous to someone in society. They were dangerous to their parents. They killed their parents. And they've been in prison for like 30 years now. And my feeling is sort of like, would the Menendez brothers shoot my parents? Uh, bad example. I, I wouldn't mind that. Would they shoot your parents? And if the answer is no, then maybe 30 years is enough for the Menendez brothers. Now, John is serving 28 years to life for second degree murder. Uh, he, uh, he shot an acquaintance with an M16 assault rifle. And I was talking to John about it on his podcast. And I said, who did you shoot? Because um, that means something to me. Um, you shooting a rival gang member is not the same as you shooting an innocent uh, mom who's walking home from the supermarket. And um, we have to be careful because there's this like, a life is a life. What are you gonna do? A life is a life. And I'm like, we should be more nuanced than that. We should think about it. I had a um, situation where somebody sent me a tweet the other day and the tweet said, you know, it was one of those, hey, douchebag tweets. And it started with the number of fatalities in New Jersey from the coronavirus is now surpassed the number of fatalities in New Jersey of men in New Jersey who went to fight the Korean War. Uh, I'll put it in numerical order. Um, Vietnam, the Korean War, and World War I. Now, I don't know why they skipped World War II, but I'm, I'm guessing that would have hurt their narrative because maybe more people from New Jersey died in World War II than in World War I, so they just sort of cobbled together an example and they did it that way. And I thought, that's a lot of people, the amount of people from New Jersey who went off to fight World War I, Vietnam and Korea, is now the number of deaths has been exceeded by the, the coronavirus. And I started to think about it, and ruminate about it a little bit. And then I thought to myself, but let's drill down on this a little bit. And this is why nuance matters. The average age in 1919 or 1920 or whenever the hell the average guy from New Jersey went off to fight in World War I, which was used as an example, the average age of that guy was probably 18 and a half. Maybe it was 19 and a half, but it was young. I mean, the guys who fought, the infantry guys who fought back then in those wars were 20 years old tops. These are 18 guys lied. They, they got in at 16 or 17. So you take this guy's example. Okay. Um, you take all these conflicts, you take all these infantry soldiers, and they all came back in a coffin and their average age was 19. Now you go to people who expired in New Jersey because of the coronavirus in modern times. Half of them died in nursing homes. So the average age of at least half of the people who died in nursing homes in New Jersey was in their 80s. So let's really break it down. And the other half, everyone who's dying is, is old or has pre-existing conditions just about across the board. So the average age of the person who died from the coronavirus in New Jersey is 79 and a half. And the average age of the guy from New Jersey who went off and fought these wars was 19 and a half. That's a huge fucking difference. Please work some nuance in your goddamn arguments. John, are you back? Adam, hey, how are you? Sorry, I had to go off on a little tangent there to buy us some Yeah, time. no, I heard you there. I was, uh, was quite something. All right. Uh, yeah, so where, what, what, uh, where were we? Uh, what was well, we were, we were everywhere, but I had a discussion yeah, on your podcast up, yeah. about crime and punishment, and, and, I, and it was kind of interesting. I, 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 I think we put together a numbered system. Oh, boy. 
Hey, Max Zapata, uh, I got yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, we put we put together one through ten, like with uh, I think I think you gauge like uh, one being like when the burglar breaks into your home and your wife shoots the burglar in the head. That's like an okay murder as far as you're concerned. These are your words, not mine. Right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. So so the ten being the um, the 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 guy that pulls the the young girl into the alleyway and. And, and, and rapes her or something like that. You want him to be, uh, you know, uh, raped in prison himself. Is that correct? He doesn't need to be raped. I'd, I'd like him. I'd like him put down. To me, in a okay. weird, in, put down. Okay. in a weird way, the scariest people on the planet are the murderers of opportunity. You know, those ones where it's like the guy. The guy's. Like when you think, I'll tell you the guy who needs to be put down and it's, e it's easy because he's Russian. So we don't have to worry about any hate crimes here. Um, Ennis Cosby was Bill Cosby's kid. Ennis Cosby was a young man and he was, I think a school teacher or something like that. Ennis Cosby was just driving home through Los Angeles off the 405 freeway, Skirball exit. And I know it well, cause I've, drove past it at the time it was happening, coming home from my nighttime gig, Loveline, his car like got a flat. He basically pulled over and got off the freeway just randomly and randomly some like 19 year old Russian gangbanger like came up to him and just shot him and killed him. That to me is the scariest guy on the planet, those guys. Yeah, um, I, mean, I mean, yeah, these are the kind of um, sort of that's not what most murders look like, though, in prison. No, I mean, no, no, no. I'm that's really why happy. he's. That's why he's the ten. Yeah, you're, I, you're I, only like a six yeah. or something. <laughs> you give me a three, but. Uh, oh, I get it. Well, no, no. I downgraded. I took your six and factored in your twenty years behind bars. Oh. I think six puts me away from like the the uh, the sort of. Um, you know, you said your wife was at a one or, or like in terms of justified or something like that. Well, look, oh, Ennis, okay. here's the deal. Ennis Cosby is dead and a burglar who broke into some house in the middle of the night who took a right. bullet in the head from the homeowner, they're both dead. But they're different right. kinds of dead in my world. Well, I'll say this, Adam. Let me say this. I mean, I was in a lifestyle where it was a, you know, it, you know, look, and when I look back on it, having, having, you know, sort of turned my life around, even though I'm in prison, you know, I've still, you know, I've still built a career for myself. I don't look, I don't, you know, I, I look at, I look at that and I'm like, you know, I'm ashamed of, of what that is. But a lot of guys, you know, you could sort of perpetuate that sort of thinking and be like, well, you know, you rationalize and you're like, you know, look, the guy had a comment or this, that, you, you could get lost in rationalization in prison, right? So look, I just try to, you know, try to be accountable for what I did and say what I did was wrong. Uh, I try not to sort of contextualize it and say too much, well, this is the lifestyle, this is what happens, because you get involved in all that and it, it's not accountability. Not that I've been sort of, you know, helped with accountability through therapy. I mean, I've kind of sorted this out in my writing and I've come to terms with what I did and what I did was wrong. I put, I hurt a family and I'm sorry for what I did. I mean, tell, tell, tell my listeners what you did. Want me to tell you, listeners? Yeah. Oh yeah, no. So I'm in the. So it's 2001. Um, I'm, you know, I'm deep in, in, in a lifestyle of selling drugs. Uh, you know, I find out, a, you know, a former friend, uh, you know, is sort of shaking down some of uh, some of my dealers, and I uh, sort of took him for a ride, and I shot him and killed him, and uh, put him uh, in the ocean cinder box, kind of like a, uh, I mean, you know, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a horrible scene and I, and I tried to get away with murder, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And, and, and it was, it was, uh, you know, it was a pretty serious crime, uh, about as, as serious as you can get. And, um, and I was indicted and, uh, and I, and I hired my, my, my mother hired a good lawyer. We tried, you know, I tried to beat the rap as you say. And, uh, uh, almost did had a hung jury and uh, and eventually I was convicted. So the system, you know, saw this. I, I'm, a, I'm a white kid that went 
looking for this lifestyle. The system saw me was like, this, look at this low life. He had an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Looking to be a, a wannabe. You know, and you know what? We're going to give him what he wants. He wants to be, he wants to be, uh, he wants to hang out with these gangsters. Let him go hang out with the gangsters. And I have been. Uh, and it's been pretty disgusting for the past 20 years. But that said, uh, you know, that's kind of what happened. What, uh, you say he was a former friend. How, how close a friend were you before this? Well, we grew up in the same housing project. Um, and I met him. I mean, I was like on Rikers Island in 96 and uh, the murder happened in 2001 and he was on the right on Rikers Island at the time and we re-met then because I had moved out of the projects and he was fighting the murder case himself and uh, he had gotten acquitted of that and I was on time, I was serving time for a gun charge and uh, we sort of re-met back in, in, uh, back in Brooklyn and we were both in the drug game and that's the kind of friends uh, where we sort of, you know, pouring our heart out to each other. I mean, these, these relationships are relatively shallow, but I mean, I knew, I knew him. I knew, you know, I knew his family. Um, I mean, he had potential, he had swagger, he had charisma. Do, do you believe he committed a murder? Yeah, I know that he did, but. Right. Okay. So, uh, but you know, our conversation we've had, we had kind of a bizarre conversation, but in my world of my, housewife shoots a burglar being one and a guy who kills Ennis Cosby on the side of the road randomly is a 10 shooting guys who murdered somebody else gets you a lower score that that's just the way I work I'm I'm very I I'm, I I draw a huge distinction between an 85 year old dying of the coronavirus and a 25 year old dying of coronavirus and to say nobody oh, right. should ever die i don't i don't work that way I, I i don't i don't think it benefits anyone to work that way i i want to know if the guy you shot was a bad guy and could have shot somebody else or maybe did shoot somebody else that's that's just my wiring now obviously what you did is wrong any way you look at it but to me who's standing on the outside of it i'd like to know so for you you said you got a hung jury. How did you get a, or, or it initially a hung jury? How did, how did that work? You get a great lawyer and uh, you try to, you know, it's these, these whole, you know, the courtroom dramas are, you know, like you see on TV, when, when you actually live it, it's, 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 it's wild, you know? So, you know, you see a show, I had a, a showman for, for, for an attorney and, uh, and, uh, you know, he sort of you know, raised a reasonable doubt. Um, you know, it was this guy, it was that. I mean, they had a whole host of sort of uh, witnesses, you know, you know, against you. You know, so he, he, you sit in the jail cell with a guy, he pops up, he starts saying, yeah, John told me he did it. And I was like, I never even met this guy before. And then my right. people sort of like cut him up on the stand. And, you know, it's just, there's, there's all types of things. They have their narrative, uh, being the prosecution has his narrative. And, and defense, defense actually has an opportunity to sort of manipulate the narrative if the defendant stays quiet. Uh, that's why the lawyers are always saying, shut up, don't say anything. And what is, what? Up, if you don't say anything, then you hear everything that they have, and then you, and then the lawyer gets to manipulate the narrative the way that he or she wants to manipulate. So it's a game of storytelling. Whoever tells the best story wins. And having you know, learn how to tell a story. I look back on it and I'm like, wow, that was, that was quite a scene. And, and justice is arbitrary, right? So some people don't get those sort of great storyteller lawyers. And, you know, um, yeah, I mean, the, the trial, you know, you, I look back on it and it's, it just, it, 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 it just hurt the, it hurt the family probably, you know, more than anything. You know, you look back on it and, and I, I should have just took the 15 of life they were offering me. And, uh, just, they, they were offering 15 to life. Right. You you didn't take it, and you got 28 years to life? That's how, that's how it works, Adam. You want to push the envelope, make them spend money, they'll give you the business. That's just, that's just how the criminal justice system works. And if you, it doesn't matter. It, it's, an, it's just interesting you, you bring that up. That, that decision is very important for a defendant, whether you 
and then you sort of it's not about accountability because how much accountability do you have when you're you're a low life right like I, I, I was I, I didn't know much about accountability when you know it was just a decision that you have to make um years later you know I understand sort of uh, you know how pivotal that moment was uh but when you you know, just, you know, I've been in prison 19 years now. I would have been home, you know, but whatever. I mean, that's just that's just how it is. You know, culpability is compounded when right. you uh, when you push the envelope. And I might add, it's not just about money. I did sort of have to drag the family through not one but two trials. So that's that's not nothing. You know, those, those people were hurt, and they were innocent. They weren't. You know, they didn't. They, didn't, they weren't in their lifestyle running around. Uh, so yeah. Know, well, but, is part of that let's just drill down on that a little bit is part of that which is the family the mother the dad the siblings the grieving whatever left behind show up at the trial and part of the deal is you have to kind of turn this guy into a low life well not me i mean my lawyer uh, right right that's his that's yeah i don't you know i'm just you just sit there and no i get it but you you have to kind of you have to take him down a few rungs and the mom has to sit there and experience yeah, that. that. Kind of, Is that what that, you're that, saying? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, look, if I, if I would have just accounted for what I did, and, and you know, they wouldn't have to go through that. So, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm do, you, do you have any contact with them? Have you had any contact with the parents, survivors? Well, I, remember, so I had this, like, documentary that was done about me, and uh, that's a whole other thing. We could probably talk about true crime on this, on, on your podcast, and we can have a... You know, when, when I settle down a bit and get into a better mode here of uh, getting access to the phone again, because they put me in this shitty uh, cell block, you know, a digression for a moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is just disgusting, the cell block. I, mean, I was in a sweeter block when I was interviewing you on my podcast. But that said, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, what, what, what was it, what, what were we, what, before I digress, what, what was I doing? Well, we were we were we were talking about you you talking to the family, uh, the surviving family yeah, members. So so yeah, so there was this doc, you know, so they were sort of contacted for this documentary that Chris Cuomo did about me, and this, uh, and uh, you know, look, they're a little disgruntled about my career, right? Um, this guy goes to prison, you know, and then becomes a, a journalist, and you know, get, get published in all these places, and you know, it's just like the fuck you know so I, I get it like i mean it's like you know it's and, and they don't they they they, they hear well, i'm talking to adam carolla right now you have like the biggest podcast on earth and the tone is important i mean here i am in prison to them i'm the guy that killed their brother right right and so what the fuck is going on as far as they're concerned right and then what? you know so i mean look it's conflict for them it's, it's major conflict, and i can emphasize with that I'm certainly sympathize with it. Well, uh, John, I don't want to go, you know, all Barbara Walters uh, on everyone's ass, but someone may give them the... Fine line. I got to look. I got to find line in terms of being, you know, Well, here's here's what I'm saying. Somebody may present this podcast to to them if they're listening. Is there anything you'd like to say? Is there anything you'd like to say about having this career that you might they might be upset about? from inside of prison? Is there any any way you'd like to articulate it to them? Yeah, look, and yeah, I mean, I would say, I would say Taisha, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I know that this is tough for you. I know, you know, I, yeah, I know that, I know that Alex has charisma just as much as charisma as me. He could have been whatever he wanted. Taisha was whom? What up? Taisha's uh, his, his sister. His sister, okay. You know, he, he could have, he could have, he could have been whatever he wanted, Alex, and I took that from him, and, uh, and I am sorry for that. But what, what I am, with what I am doing now, it's just like you know, this is the other part of that life that 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 he and I both lived when we were making poor decisions. And he could have very well been in here with me too. And I write about things that are really important, and you know, I just. I just, you know, I just ask for their forgiveness, and and hopefully, and that's a tricky thing too, right? But, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I just hope, you know, one day, for, for them, more than me, you know, for them, because that, that, that's tough, you know. Yes, with. you mean, so they forgive, they get closure, so to speak, and they can move on yeah. with their lives. 
tough, tough work, coach. But uh, especially when you, you, know, you shoot a man to, to death and you know do what I did. And, but um, look, they're, they're chasing me off the phone yet again. Um, I love talking to you, man. Um, and I think uh, uh, hopefully we could do it again uh, when you get a chance and when things are a little, uh, you know, sort of smoother on my end. Is that cool? Yeah, we'll pick it up again when they let you into a better cell block or cell phone block or whatever they're calling it, and we'll we'll figure it out. John, I'll, you can hang up. I'll give you the plugs, and I'll kind of wrap it up here. Thanks so much, uh, Adam, and uh, I'll, I'll speak to you again. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll give you the plugs in a second. Yeah, so what I was talking to John about on his podcast, and his podcast is called This is a Collect Call from Sing Sing, you know, we were talking about crime and punishment. And for me, um, I like details and I like nuance. I want to know if somebody who killed somebody has possibly killed other people or been accused of killing other people or has had a life in crime versus, look, um, you could be the best citizen in the world, the best dad, the best uh, neighbor, the best small business owner. You could go to a Christmas party, you could get drunk, uh, you could drive home and you could hit a kid on a bicycle and kill them. And uh, that then you are a person who murdered somebody, but there's a lot of nuance in there. So what I was kind of talking to John about on his podcast is I was trying to figure out a sort of a numbered system, so to speak. And, you know, when you get into this nuance, and I know everything is seen through the lens of the coronavirus now, but I do want to see things that way. So when I say, hey, there's a difference between uh, 19-year-olds from uh, New Jersey dying in World War I and 89-year-olds dying in a nursing home, all the, all the folks go, Oh, come on, Adam, a death is a death. Or, or and then they start going down this nonsensical road like, oh, so you think, so if that was your mom, if that was your grandma, you, you want this? It's like, I don't want anything. Uh, I'm not defending the guy who got drunk and killed the guy on the bike. I'm not for drunk driving. I'm not for vehicular manslaughter. What I'm for is justice, but it can't just be, a light switch, a toggle switch. It needs to be a dimmer. We need to be able to adjust it a little bit and have the punishment meet the crime. And when I was talking to John, I was saying, okay, you killed somebody. I want to know who you killed. And I want to know who that person was and, and if that person possibly killed anybody else. That, that's a factor to me. We'll never get anywhere if you just go, killing is wrong and it's all the same and blah, blah, blah. It is, it is not. I, uh, back to New Jersey, I have two kids. They're going to turn 14 in a month. Um, if I were to know that they were going to die at 19, I would be very upset. And if I were to know that they were going to die in a nursing home at 84, I would not only not be nearly as upset, I would probably be a little relieved. I'd be like, oh, okay, they get to lead a nice long life. Awesome. So nuance. Now, if you gave me a third category, which is what if they never died, I'd probably check that box. Or maybe just for the boy. Anyway, um, my point is, is there's nuance. We must look at everything through that lens. And what I was saying to John is, is who did you kill? Okay. What were the circumstances? Okay. And then the other part is, how long have you been incarcerated? How long, how, how much have you been punished for who you killed and who are you now in prison? Which um, I also factored in. And then when I was done, I gave him a number. And let's, let's think about it. Uh, I said, uh, shooting a, a a burglar who breaks in your house in the middle of the night, that's a one, killing Ennis Cosby on the side of the road for no good reason, that's a 10. So in my world, um, if you are a 10 and you've been in prison for 10 minutes and you're still a horrible person, then you need to stay there for a good long time and or 
probably be put to death. And if you're just a random opportunity killer, I would like you put to death. If you're the vehicular manslaughter guy, well, then you're somewhere in between the 10 and the one. Let's give you a five. So you're a five. So I would like you punished, but I don't want you put to death. But the one I want no punishment for. The housewife that was home with her kids when somebody broke in and she shot him, that's a zero burger. That's on the person that broke into the home. So, and then you go, hey, but Adam, isn't one dead? Yeah, 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 I got it. I don't want that person punished at all. I want the 10 put to death and I want the five to be punished, but not 25 years in prison. And I'd also like some restitution. I'd like the punishment of the businessman who killed the kid on the bike. I would like him to work toward restitution to not only you know, sitting somewhere and rotting, but being of service or paying, or let's say the young kid he killed had an older sister. Could that businessman put the older sister through college? That's the way I'm wired. All right, let me hit uh, Geico before we uh, wrap it up. You uh, want to save some money? You want to save, you want to do a little bundling? You have homeowner's insurance, you have renter's insurance. You have to have one or the other. You have automotive insurance. We'll put them all together. Bundle them at geico.com. You go to geico.com. You find out just how much you could be saving when you bundle your insurance and get it all under one umbrella at geico.com. Dr. Uh, David Katz, who was on uh, Bill Maher last week, he's uh, coming up. He'll be on uh, tomorrow. And uh, you can uh, go to uh, adamcarolla.com and see what we're doing. Or go check out our YouTube page, youtube.com slash adamcarolla. And uh, you can also look at free comedy, stand-up comedy clips there. And uh, go to Chassis, C-H-A-S-S-Y. Get some of our Blu-rays over there. And uh, pre-order my new book. I'm your emotional... I'm your mo emotional support animals. Easy for you to say. It's uh, available for pre-order on Amazon coming out uh, soon in June. And until next time, this is uh, Adam Carolla, Regina Grad, Bald Brian, and John J. Lennon saying mahalo. <laughs>